There are a lot, and I mean a lot, of articles and videos all over the internet covering the supposed deadliest spiders in the world, each as poorly researched and asinine as the next. Combing through these vessels of voluminous stupidity makes me feel like a disgruntled teacher marking assignments written by those students in the back row who spent the entirety of class peeling glue off their hands. And after hours spent watching and snarkily commenting on a never-ending stream of clickbait top 10 biggest and top 10 deadliest videos, things got extremely dull and repetitive for me and I eventually burned out of making my reaction videos. For me, a logical next step was to create my own, more accurate versions of these lists. Which I already started with my Top 5 Biggest Centipedes video, hosted in response to this train wreck. This time I'll be discussing the most dangerous spiders in the world. However, given the detail in which I intend to cover the subjects, as well as the unfeasibility of creating a definitive hierarchical list due to various complicating factors when measuring spider venom potencies, this won't be a top 10 or even a top 5 list, or quite frankly a list at all. Instead, I'll be focusing on just two groups of spiders, the South American wandering spiders from the genus Phonutria, and the Australian funnel webs from the family Atracidae. These constitute arguably the most notorious spiders worldwide, infamous not only within their native lands but across the globe, and people are none too slow to point at either of them as justification for the widespread and wildly disproportionate fear of spiders in our general populace. But to what extent do these, widely regarded as the spider world's heaviest hitters, live up to their fearsome reputations? Are they aggressive, lethal monsters, harbingers of terror and reasons to hastily cross their native countries off your bucket list? Or are they, like so many animals we fear, simply misunderstood, the unfortunate targets of endless internet hysteria, exacerbated by years worth of the misinformed misinforming the misinformed? Well, let's have a quick overview of each, starting with the Australian funnel webs. Australian funnel webs form a family known as the Atracidae, which currently contains 36 described species within three genera, Atrax, Illawarra, and Hadronici. Easily the most well-known member of the family is Atrax robustus, the Sydney funnel web. So well known indeed that it completely overshadows every other member of this fascinating group, leading to funnel webs being almost entirely associated with Sydney the full extent of their range and diversity unbeknownst to many. Funnel webs belong to the infraorder Mygalomorphy, a group of spiders that also includes tarantulas and trapdoor spiders, characterised by various features including downward pointing fangs and two pairs of book lungs. Many Mygalomorphs, funnel webs in particular, exhibit laughably poor athleticism, being unable to climb smooth surfaces, jump, nor maintain high speeds over any significant distance. And if that's not enough, their eyesight is crap too. I mean seriously, what's the point of having eight eyes and being almost blind? That's like having eight brains and being a creationist. It's a good thing for them that they have such a potent venom. Without it, they'd be the laughing stock of the spider world. Heck, who am I kidding? They're still a laughing stock even with their venom. Having said that, these cranky couch potatoes are still good at one thing, aside from being centipede food, and that's ambush. While sustained activity is almost completely off limits for these fat fuckers, they can move with impressive speed and power in short bursts, perfect for catching prey items unaware. Funnel webs mostly remain within the vicinity of their lair unless forcibly evicted, with adult males being a notable exception. As is the case for my Gallimorph spiders in general, male funnel webs will, upon reaching maturity, wander in search of females for the remainder of their relatively short lives. It is during this brief nomadic phase that these spiders are most likely to be encountered by humans. Funnel web spiders will respond to a perceived threat differently depending on the situation. 
A spider that is in or near its burrow will nearly always run for cover if you can call it running. Those that are caught out in the open are more likely to stand their ground, raising their front legs and exposing their fangs, which are, quite frankly, the only remotely impressive aspect of their anatomy, so I don't blame them for wanting to show them off. Contrary to widespread belief, they do not, indeed cannot, chase people. Now let's move on to the wandering spiders. Wandering spiders form a family known as the Tinidae. However, most members of this group are not regarded as dangerous, with only the genus Phonutria having caused human fatalities. Unlike funnel webs, wandering spiders are araniomorphs, a more derived clade of spiders with diaxial or inward pointing fangs. If you would like to see a more in-depth coverage of the major spider groups and their distinctions, feel free to check out episode 3 of the Guide to Australian Spiders series. Phonutria are large spiders, easily outweighing most funnel webs except for the very biggest species like Hadronici formidabilis and Hadronici versuta, and some can reach leg spans exceeding 15 centimetres, dimensions rivalling those of Australia's largest huntsmen. They are highly mobile, very adept at navigating the dense undergrowth of the neotropical rainforests they call home and have none of the physical shortcomings that make funnel web spiders so profoundly underwhelming. Like funnel webs, however, phonutria may rear up on their hind legs in response to a disturbance. While the upper surface of a phonutria is rather cryptic, indicating that camouflage is the spider's first line of defence, the animal's underside, particularly on the legs, often bears vibrant colours, and when the spider rears up, the sudden appearance of these bold markings on what appeared at first to be a somewhat drably coloured creature creates what I presume would be a most shocking display for any animal that gets too inquisitive. So now you've had a quick introduction to both of these heavy hitters, but before we start talking about their respective danger levels, I think it'd be worth going over what I mean by danger. When it comes to venomous animals and how hazardous they are to humans, many people seem to be hell-bent on debating one thing and one thing only – venom potency. This is undeniably a pertinent factor if one intends to assess the risk an animal poses. Obviously, a stronger venom would do more harm than a mild one. However, there are a multitude of other factors at play that make it, at least in my opinion, a bit erroneous to think the strength of either spider's venom is the end-be-all when deciding which of the two is more dangerous. For example, temperament and likelihood of encounters, among other factors, all affect the overall danger an animal poses. As an example, let's take a look at Oxyuranus microlepidotus, sometimes known as the inland taipan. As far as drop for drop potency goes, this is considered to be the most venomous snake in the world. However, its passive demeanour and remote distribution effectively nullify the overall danger it poses to people, and it is responsible for a grand total of zero recorded fatalities. So, most venomous snake in the world? Sure. Most dangerous snake in the world? Absolutely not. So with that in mind, let's get into the comparison, starting off with these two spiders' respective bite lethalities. I won't really be going into their drop-for-drop -drop venom potencies, as that's only one factor, and when it comes to determining which of the spiders is more dangerous, the overall severity of the bites is to me the more important thing to discuss. Funnel webs, as aforementioned, are a much more speciose and widespread group than often realised, and while all members of the family are regarded as medically significant for precaution's sake, currently only 6 out of the 36 described species have had instances of severe envenoming associated with them. Much of the following information here is based on this article which reviews the effects and severity of numerous reliably identified funnel web envenomations, spanning multiple species. The study defined a severe envenomation as one in which three or more features of systemic envenoming occurred, and from at least two of the groups shown. 
Other categories were mild to moderate and minor to local. It's also worth noting that a severe envenomation isn't necessarily a life-threatening one. The six funnel web species with cases of severe envenoming attributed to their names were Atrax robustus, the infamous Sydney funnel web, which was also responsible for by far the largest number of bites, Hadronychi cerveria, a rather small tree-dwelling species, Hadronychi formidabilis, the largest of the funnel webs and also a tree-dweller, Hadronychi infensa, again a large species and likely the most widespread funnel web in southeast Queensland, Hadronychi macquariensis, which at the time did not have a proper name and was simply labelled as Hadronychi species 14, and Hadronychi versuta, a very big and bulky species found around the Blue Mountains. This study reviewed a total of 198 potential bites, and of those, 138 were cases where the spider responsible was expertly identified as a funnel web, which are displayed in this table. Here, the severity of envenomations from numerous species are shown. It's worth noting that of the six species I mentioned before, ones that have inflicted bites that resulted in symptoms classified as severe, only three caused such symptoms in over half of the cases examined. Atrax robustus, Hadronychi cerveria, and Hadronychi formidabilis. And out of those, the two tree-dwelling species were the only ones that appeared to cause severe envenomation symptoms in a clear majority of recorded cases, with Atrax robustus bites being fairly evenly split between mild and severe. In addition to this, there is a very real possibility of publication bias in favour of severe envenomations, as bites in which only mild or moderate symptoms occurred are less noteworthy, and therefore less likely to be publicised. The article I've been referencing acknowledges this, and thus features a second figure that omitted data from sources other than museum records and a previous prospective study in order to reduce the potential effects of sampling bias. This table, unlike the previous one which doesn't show much more than the raw data, displays the sample rates of severe envenoming, as well as the corresponding 95% confidence intervals. Don't understand what I'm on about? Well, I'll try to explain, although I won't go on for too long because, bleh, statistics. Basically, it'd be impossible to gauge the true rate of severe envenoming for any species. You'd need data from every bite that ever occurred. So we instead rely on samples to estimate the rates. In this instance, the leftmost percentages represent the sample rates of severe envenoming, the rates obtained from the data in the study. The 95% confidence interval represents the range within which we can be 95% confident that the true rate lies. Note how the range of the confidence interval is narrower for species with a greater number of bites, as we can produce more precise estimates with a larger sample size. The most notable change here is that the envenomation rate of Atrax robustus received a greater nerf than Dunkleosteus after its new size estimate. Meanwhile, the two tree dwellers still caused severe symptoms in the majority of examined cases, even with the aforementioned omission of data from certain sources. Furthermore, of the 77 total cases involving severe envenomation symptoms, and here we're back to talking about the full data set, not the one used for the previous table, only 13 resulted in the victim's death, all of which took place before the introduction of an effective antivenom in 1981. What's more, a further 16 instances of severe envenoming that also took place before the antivenom was devised did not prove to be fatal. It's commonly said that without antivenom, a bite from one of these spiders is nothing short of a death sentence. However, this study shows that even before the antivenom's introduction, it was more common than not to survive a funnel web bite. In fact, approximately 90% of Atrax bites, which make up the majority of funnel web envenomations, are not deemed serious enough to warrant the usage of antivenom. 
Now, let's move on to the other big contender, Phonutria, the Brazilian wandering spiders. In spite of the common name, these spiders are by no means restricted to Brazil, occupying a large portion of South and Central America. The genus contains several species, of which Phonutria ferra and Phonutria nigraventa are among the most well-known and medically important. Anyway, are these spiders as overrated as the funnel webs, or do they deserve their reputation? Let's find out. This study examined the hospital records of 422 victims of Phonutria bites, all of which involved the capture and identification of the spider responsible, so there is little chance of misattribution. Similarly to the review of funnel web envenomations I cited earlier, the study categorised the bites across multiple levels of severity, based off the symptoms present. A bite was considered asymptomatic when no manifestations occurred. Mild, for instances of minor symptoms such as local pain and restlessness. Moderate, when systemic effects such as sweating and occasional vomiting accompanied the above. And severe, in the presence of more concerning symptoms such as pulmonary edema, which is the build-up of fluid in the lungs. And priapism, possibly the most well-known effect of these spider's bites, which is, in essence, a long-lasting and rather painful erection. Sounds pretty scary, am I right? But how often do these nasty effects occur? Well, prepare to be thoroughly underwhelmed. Out of the over 400 bites examined in this study, the percentage that caused severe symptoms was... <laughs> was pathetic. Sitting at around 0.5 of 1%, or roughly 1 in 200. This graph here displays the frequencies of the four levels of severity across three different age groups. Moderate symptoms were more common in both children and the elderly, and severe symptoms, of which there were only two cases, were restricted to children, both of whom were under five years of age. Antivenom was required in around 2.3% of cases, most of which, predictably, involved children. That's not to say an adult has no reason to treat these spiders with a degree of respect. For example, this case report, published after the previous study and thus obviously not referenced in it, details an incident in which a previously healthy 52-year-old man suffered severe symptoms after receiving a phonutria bite to the neck, though he made a full recovery. So it's clear that severe envenoming can occur in more than just children. Though, of course, the neck is hardly a common place for a bite, most of which take place on the victim's limbs, a location on which bites are generally less serious. With all that said, I think it's still abundantly clear that, while the Brazilian wandering spiders warrant a healthy dose of caution, their bites are hardly the death sentence they're often said to be. So, at the moment, it seems the funnel webs are the clear winners, with species like Atrax robustus, Hadronici cerberia, and Hadronici formidabilis having far higher rates of severe envenoming than Phonutria. But let's not be too quick to jump to conclusions. I didn't go off on that tangent about how danger is affected by a whole cocktail of different factors for nothing. The likelihood of a bite has a substantial influence on the overall danger either of these spiders pose, and is in turn affected by factors such as their behaviour and distribution. Funnel webs are vulnerable to desiccation and have very limited mobility, which means that they are often restricted to small pockets of suitable habitat such as remnant rainforests. So while their extent of occurrence is quite broad, their area of occupancy is much more scattered and patchy. And since funnel webs tend to do best in habitats that have been subjected to minimal disturbance, our urban concrete jungles are, needless to say, not the most ideal home sites for these spiders. Sure, Atrax robustus may occur around the Sydney area, but you're not going to be finding them touring the Opera House or strolling along Circular Quay. They'll mostly be restricted to patches of bushland. And even if one does find its way into a human dwelling, 
The ease at which these moisture-bound spiders desiccate means that it would probably last about as long as my attention span during a statistics lecture. Then there's the two tree funnel webs, Hadronici cerberia and Hadronici formidabilis. The dangers that these spiders pose to the general populace is largely nullified by their habits and distribution. Not only do they mostly reside in out-of-the-way locations, paperbark forests for Hadronici cerberia and mountainous rainforests for Hadronici formidabilis, but their tendency to live almost exclusively up trees means that these spiders are highly unlikely to be encountered, let alone bitten by. On top of that, funnel webs are extremely sedentary, and reluctant to leave the safety of their burrows. Genuinely, I'd say that you could have a funnel web set up its home site under your bed and not pose any real danger to you. The only exceptions to this are, of course, mature males looking for a mate, which mainly happens during the summer months as a result of the warmer, wetter weather. It's a different story for the wandering spiders, which are behaviourally about as different from funnel webs as a spider can get. The name wandering spider is a pretty apt descriptor, as these spiders live far more active lifestyles than the perpetually overweight funnel webs. While the only funnel webs that can be motivated to get out and exercise are horny old males desperate to get laid before they kick the bucket, wandering spiders are active and mobile their entire lives, irrespective of sex. Furthermore, they are far less vulnerable to desiccation, making them much more suited to living in human dwellings. As such, unwanted encounters with phonutria are probably a more likely occurrence than run-ins with funnel webs within these spiders' respective ranges. This, combined with the possibility that it'd be easier to receive medical attention in Eastern Australia, which is where funnel webs principally occur, than it would be in many parts of South America, means that in spite of the funnel webs seemingly having a clear win in terms of bite severity, I'd be inclined to say that, overall, the wandering spiders take the cake as far as danger is concerned. Which is a good thing. Looking at funnel webs, I think they've taken enough cakes already. But ultimately, this wasn't a contest over which is more deadly. It was a contest between two massively overrated animals to see which one is a little bit less overrated. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to subscribe and take a look at some of my other uploads. If you didn't enjoy it, please leave an incoherent comment in all caps for our amusement. Thank you very much for watching and I shall see you all again very soon.